I'm Kyle Platt, and I just wanted you to know that we are offering a, a free 30-day trial for Liberty.me right now. You can just go and sign up 30 free days, and then if you are referred by someone on the site as well, you get $5 off your, uh, your subscription for the rest of recorded history. So that's really awesome. Be sure to do that if you're watching these interviews uh, and you enjoy them. If you'd like to see more, check out the content on liberty.me. Go ahead and sign up for your 30-day 30 free, 30 free trial today. I'm here with Will Grigg, and I'm very excited for this interview. Will uh, is a columnist for lourockwell.com. He blogs at Pro Libertate, and he is just a, an expert on the police state. He's written a great liberty guide on liberty.me for um, alternatives to the police state. So, Will, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Well, Kyle, it's a privilege to be with you. Thank you so much. And I just also wanted to give a shout out to Jeffrey Tucker, who completely got in the way of our interview last week, uh, 30 minutes before we were supposed to start. He uh, he said, hey, it would be great to interview Will Grigg. And uh, so he sent, <laughs> sent you a message. And uh, But he can't stop us now because we're already on the uh, interview. So uh, love you, Jeff. All right. What I wanted to talk about was the media response to what happened in Las Vegas a couple weeks ago. We got Jared and Amanda Miller, who are a couple of folks that claim to be pro-liberty advocates. They gunned down a couple of cops, and then they shot a civilian as well, and they draped a Gadsden flag as well as, uh, I believe it was reported, uh, as well as a Nazi flag on one of the cops. Uh, I'm not sure if that was to parody uh, police or if it was to say that they were in fact neo-nazis you know every time something like this happens there's a lot of hot air a lot of buzz around the media and you never know what the facts are a lot of stuff gets reported that's not true what we have also is Joan Walsh coming out and writing in an article for Salon and she says you know a, a while back I was talking to Bill O'Reilly and I told him I told him that if you keep up this right-wing rhetoric, this rhetoric of hate, that someone is gonna get hurt, someone's gonna get killed. And I've noticed that this is a narrative in terms of liberal pundits, that yes. any kind of right-wing, any kind of small government rhetoric leads to killings like this. I don't know if you've noticed that. I don't know if you've noticed that rhetorical yeah. style, but I'm wondering, what do you think about this? I mean, I, I've watched, uh, I hate to keep rambling, but it happens all the time. You watch someone like Ed Schultz on MSNBC. He has a segment on his show called Psycho Talk. He always calls Republicans, uh, he always says they, they are engaging in the politics of hate. And I'm wondering, what does this mean? Do they really believe this rhetoric? Do they really believe that right wing, and I don't even know if right wing is the correct term for it, any kind of small government talk leads to killings. Yes. The most important thing about what happened in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago in terms of the identity of the accused shooters is that Gerard and Amanda Miller were informants for the police department, the same police department that employed the two officers who were murdered by them. And murder is the appropriate term. If you shoot somebody in the back of the head, that's not applied non-aggression, especially if you're talking about people who were involved in peaceful commerce at the time. They were eating pizza for lunch and one of them, as it happens, who was a distant relative of mine, uh, Mr. Alan Beck, Officer Alan Beck, was a second cousin of my wife, Corinne. He was getting a refill of his soft drink when he was shot in the head, allegedly, by Gerard Miller, somebody who had been distantly employed by the same police department. And allegedly, they were involved in a plot, or they'd sketched out a rough draft of a plot uh, to kidnap people and hold hostages at a, local, at a local courthouse there. And as I read that, I was struck by the fact that they're alleged plot followed in basic contours, something that the Metro Police Department's Intelligence Division had set up last year with the two-time loser by the name of uh, Bruschi, David Allen Bruschi, who was arrested on the Las Vegas Strip for selling water as if that were a crime, and then put in a cell with the fellow who identified himself as part of the sovereign citizen movement, very carefully led him once he was out of jail 
into a plot that was manufactured by the Metro Police Department as a Homeland Security Theater production. As a matter of fact, the officer who was the undercover agent who arranged this said that he specialized in what he called theater productions. And their plot was that Metro Police officers would be randomly abducted off the streets of Las Vegas and then taken into a courtroom somewhere and put on trial and then executed and their bodies would be dumped in the Nevada desert. Now that was the sort of thing the Metro Police Department was messing with a year ago. And then a year later, you've got, roughly a year later, you've got blowback in the form of a couple of people who have been informants with Nevada law enforcement. Uh, Gerard Miller had a very long list of convictions, most of which had to do with narcotics, and narcotics you shouldn't be considered a crime. But he'd expressed frustration over the fact that he had an ankle monitor and that he was on apparently interminable, proba uh, interminable probation. And he'd spent a great deal of time in the company of this group of people who were part of the state-sanctified state uh, official purveyors of violence. And he'd picked up habits of mind, I contend, from them that were reflected in the idea that he could simply use force summarily to kill people for reasons that struck him as suitable, that would strike no reasonable person as suitable. And so I think it's important when we talk about their background here to recognize that their direct link with the Metro Police Department is a far more important association than their temporary and largely undesirable association with Clive and Bundy and his uh, supporters there at Bunkerville, they had the good sense to evict them from Bunkerville once it had become clear that these were not people who were interested in protecting property, but were pursuing a different agenda. And so you have the perceptiveness on the part of Bundy and the supporters, as opposed to apparently the critical and, and fatal blindness on the part of the Metro Police Department regarding the disposition of these people they've been cultivating for their own purposes. Oh, on the other subject, the, the other question you asked here, about what I call guilt by climatological metaphor, the idea that hate talk about government, and government, of course, is supposed to be the recipient of our unqualified love at all time. Hate talk about government supposedly precipitates into violence. There's a Supreme Court ruling, I believe it was Olmstead, about almost 100 years ago, dealing with wiretapping. That was during the era of, of alcohol prohibition, not narcotics prohibition, but alcohol prohibition, which begat narcotics prohibition. But in that ruling, uh, one of the dissenting judges, I believe it was Brandeis, said that government is the great teacher and that by cultivating, cultivating disrespect for law and disrespect for rights and by facilitating violence, government is teaching people very critical lessons that are going to yield very disturbing results. And when people are speaking ill of government, they're acting as Americans. That's basically our proudest tradition, our political and social heritage, is people do not like to be ruled and wouldn't put up with being ruled. You take a look at the outpourings of people like Samuel Adams and Thomas Paine in the late 18th century when they were openly being seditionists in urging that the colonists withdraw their consent to be ruled by the king. You're taking a look at rhetoric that is several uh, orders of magnitude more uh, incendiary than most of the things that are said about government today and the people who exercise uh, the supposed authority that they've been given by, by the public. And so this is the sort of thing that tends to follow the partisan alignment here. When you had George W. Bush and his clique in power, then you had Sean Hannity execrating people who were opposed to the Iraq war as if we were undermining the government and siding with our enemies and committing acts that should be prosecutable. Flip the narrative now. You've got Ed Schultz who's like a stupider Sean Hannity if such a thing can be imagined. <laughs> I'm sorry. Basically, basically taking the same tack and... Uh, and accusing people like you and me and other critics of the Obama administration have been consistent in our criticism of government lawlessness of fomenting terrorism and undermining public order. It's all a question of who does what to whom. And right now, the who and whom have been inverted. And ere long, perhaps we'll have a Republican in the White House, and you'll have Fox News and people in that cohort who are playing the role that Ed Schultz and the dwindling number of Obama dead-enders at MSNBC are playing right now. That's true. I, I guess it's not fair to just indict liberals for it. Uh, when when uh, people yeah. criticize George W. Bush, folks like Sean Hannity, like you were saying, on Fox News would say that they were enabling terrorists. So I guess it's on one side you're enabling terrorists, on the other side you're enabling, uh, I guess, militant white supremacists. But that brings up something about the Bundy Ranch. You spent some time in Bunkerville. And I so did. I think that you are more qualified to talk about this than most. Is, is this kind of, I don't know, is this kind of white supremacist 
rhetoric that the left uses against the Bundy Ranch, against Gerard and Amanda Miller. Is this a problem with small government types? Is this a thing that libertarians need to think about more? Or is it just rhetoric that liberals are using to discredit small government types? More the latter than the former, especially in the case of Clive and Bundy, who is no part of a white supremacist. The notorious little film clip that was incessantly played for several days a few weeks ago, where he was <laughs> caught in the act of saying things that were somewhat crudely stated, but not at all racist, uh, was something that provides an interesting window into the mindset of this man. He was talking not only about the fact, in fact it is, that what's happened in the war on drugs particularly has resulted in a larger imprisoned and enslaved population of black Americans than you had under Jim Crow and arguably under slavery. Uh, he was also talking about the fact that he had hired people from Mexico who had come to the United States without government permission or so-called illegals. And he was actually reproaching some of the people who had gathered at Bunkerville to support him. I'd heard more than a few people lament that the United States government was sending troops overseas and sending the BLM paramilitaries out to confront this rancher who was defending his property rights. Why shouldn't they? Why aren't they at the borders holding the illegals back? More than a few people said that sort of thing. So I knew something of the atmosphere there among the people who had rallied to his cause. And remarkably, what Clive and Bundy was saying is that they're people, they're here, they're good people in many ways. They live lives that are better than those that most Americans on this side of the border have been living. So they should be here. They should be joining us in trying to beat back the encroachment of omnivorous government. That was what he was saying. It was actually somebody reaching beyond his comfort zone, albeit, albeit in language that would set off all kinds of trigger warnings for pajama boarding people of that ilk who seem to think that uh, the most grievous sin you can commit is an offense against politically correct etiquette. Uh, he was actually exhorting people to think in terms of uh, individual standing against uh, government aggression and lawlessness. And so in terms of Clive and Bundy's inclinations, I don't think that he's any part of a white supremacist. When I was down there, I ran into a couple of people who, like myself, are what would be referred to as Native Americans. In this case, I'm thinking of a fellow who's uh, an Apache Indian who came down from southern Utah along with a group of people from the American Indian Movement. Some of you might remember AIM from the 1970s. They were there to stand shoulder to shoulder with Clive and Bundy because they know how federal land grabs operate. They wrote the book on it, literally. And if you take a look at the extended activist movement in Nevada for property rights, you have people like Raymond Yowell, who is a chief of one of the bands, the Western Shoshone. And then you have the, the family, the Dan family, who are two sisters and and a brother, I think one of the sisters has, has passed away now. She actually died on a ranch property there in Nevada. They'd all been expropriated the same way that the BLM was trying to expropriate the Bundys for the same reasons. And the biggest difference here is that for whatever reason, uh, people who profess to be anguished over the, the plight of the American Indian, the Native Americans, did rally to the cause of these Nevada ranchers who were being treated several years ago the way that Clive and Bundy was being treated by the BLM. The biggest difference is that Bundy fought back. But it doesn't have anything to do with melanin content, quite frankly. Most of these people, of course, have been brought up in religious traditions and political traditions where matters of race and ethnicity have been described as something important. But I think that Bundy was actually trying to reach beyond those categories. And this is a remarkable thing for a man in the late seventh decade of his life to do. And rather than addressing what he said on its merits, of course, this got shoehorned into a prefabricated narrative where obviously the man has to be a white supremacist because he hates the government. And the only reason why people hate the federal government is residual resentment over the way the war between the states turned out. You can actually find clippings where self-appointed pundits have said similar things about this. All these people who are opposing big government, that's actually something they're doing to sublimate their racism because racism is basically the only motive why anybody would object to the Leviathan state to begin with. Sure, but there were uh, white supremacists on the ranch supporting Bundy. And I'm, yeah. wa I'm wondering if this is something that we should address as libertarians and supporters of Clive and Bundy, and especially supporters of the Shoshone natives uh, who have a right to that land especially. Uh, the narrative has been constructed by, I hate to use the term liberal media, I hate to, but... <laughs> But it exists, it, and it, it's only the liberal media because the liberals are in power right now. So yeah. <laughs> at least I, I'll, I'll preface it with that. But 
the narrative has been constructed. There were white supremacist uh, militias on the ranch supporting Bundy. And Gerard and Amanda Miller, whether they're white supremacists or not, did lay the Nazi flag on the two police officers slain in Las Vegas. I'm just wondering if this is something that we need to address as libertarians. Oh, I think we should be addressing and rebuking racial collectivism of all stripes and all varieties. And there were some people who were attracted to Bundyville who represent that perspective. And of course, it's it's wrong, and I consider it immoral. In the case of Gerard and Amanda Miller, I think that the swastika flag was a commentary on their perception of the police, not sure. something that betokened their own personal sympathies. Because before they ended up in Nevada, in Indianapolis, or actually in Lafayette, Indiana, which is where I think uh, Gerard Miller lived for much of his life, they were very active with the Occupy Wall Street movement. They were at a they were seen at a public protest for Anonymous. And I don't know if they were doing this as cat's paws for some law enforcement agency or out of a sense of conviction, but in whatever ideological gumbo constituted uh, Gerard Miller's worldview, there's no evidence that he was a white supremacist. I think he was plugged into that narrative. But when you're talking about ethnic supremacism of any variety, that's obviously a form of collectivism, and it should be denounced as such. And I don't want to tear windows into the souls of men and try to assess what their inner motives would be in terms of how they would perceive me on account of my ethnicity or anybody else's. I much more cleave to Thomas Jefferson's wisdom about how the, the critical question is, does this pick my pocket or break my leg? You know, somebody considers me to be inferior because... I'm a large brown male as opposed to a, a white male. I don't really care as long as he's not either directly aggressing against me or by way of government trying to commit aggression against me. And I think that we ought to we had approach it from that perspective while of course rebuking racial collectivism as evil and potentially murderous. Definitely. I think then that we can look at the laying of the Nazi flag on top of the the recently slain bodies as a kind of very unfortunate choice, uh, course of action, very similar to slaying the three individuals in Las Vegas as just a yeah. very poor decision based possibly in decent motives, but the choice of action was stupid, both from a moral standpoint and from a strategy standpoint. I think they were trying to find some way to sanitize something that every moral person would recognize was a horrible crime. You know, murder is literally the worst thing that you can do to a human being. Arguably, torture would be maybe a little bit worse in some respects, you know, trying to extract some kind of uh, pleasure or prurient satisfaction out of the suffering of another human being might be a little bit worse than simply killing that person. But what they did, I think, would strike anybody burdened with a conscience as horrible on its face. And I think they were trying to wrap in the political message that would resonate with people. And rather than doing so, of course, what they have done, assuming that they acted on motives that would be in any sense uh, worthwhile, uh, what, they, what they did was they advanced the cause of state consolidation. Because now people are being told that anytime they hear somebody talking about the Constitution or talking about individual liberty, which is a better subject to discuss, uh, they should be looked upon as potential Gerard and Amanda Millers. And I don't know that that's the legacy they wanted to leave, but that's the legacy they left nonetheless. Sure. And that makes me think of something that we can really wrap up this discussion with. Your relationship, both as a critic of the police state and as a distant relative of one of the police officers slain in this conflict, I think allows you to speak very even-handed on this issue. Some libertarians have come out and said that this kind of thing is self-defense, this kind of thing is a positive for liberty. Why do you think that it's not? That, in my opinion, savors of the rationale that we should go to Iraq and kill Muslims so that we're fighting them over there rather than fighting them over here. It partakes of the same presumption of, of preemptive applied defense that has been used by the state to justify drone strikes and justify pattern of life type of targeted killings. Uh, you do not define people as a collective, as a target, and kill that group and then claim that you're defending yourself against something they may do. That, that is in no sense a type of non-aggression. That has to be considered aggressive violence. 
if you're talking about police officers as tax consumers, which of course they are, and I talk about that all the time, the same can be said of more than half of the American population. We all participate in some sense because we're not given any choice right now in this evil system that Bastier talked about where everybody tries to live at the expense of everybody else through plundered wealth. And police officers do that at both in terms of whatever they receive by way of government largesse and entitlements, so-called, but also in terms of their salary. If we're going to start killing people on the basis of the fact that they're in receipt of plundered largesse, then we have a formula for a war of all against all, and that's something that uh, will exterminate liberty rather than promoting it. Police officers who engage in aggressive violence are aggressors, and they should be repelled as such, and that's a suitable thing to do. Police officers who are eating lunch and engaging in peaceful commerce are consumers. They're not aggressors. You see, we define ourselves by what we do rather than who we supposedly are in terms of the collective to which we're assigned. And I think that a lot of the arguments I've seen that some libertarians have made defending this crime uh, are a type of attenuated collectivism. They've decided that we're going to divide people into groups and assign a certain people uh, to these groups for the purpose of dispensing with them with extreme prejudice when they're not committing an act of aggression at the time that we confront them. And I don't see how that's going to be of any benefit in terms of promoting the ideal of individual liberty or in practice where it's going to have any useful benefit in terms of advancing the cause of liberty for the society at, at large. And it's not just the fact that Alan Beck's a distant relative that prompted me to, to write about this. I've mentioned this before in some of the commentary I've offered about the killings in Las Vegas. If we assume that police officers as a class are aggressors that can be dealt with as aggressors through lethal force at any time, what do we do about those rare and valuable in instances where police officers are actually protecting fellow citizens against criminal violence by other police officers? Would we be entitled to kill both police officers, the aggressor and the one who's acting as a peace officer, by defending a citizen? I don't see how you can posit the idea that police officers as a class are subject to summary execution without saying that those who are doing something that would be literally and, and quite commendably defensive would also be subject to summary execution. People like Ramon Perez in Austin, Texas, who refused to taser an elderly man and lost his job because of that or Regina Tasca in Bogota, New Jersey, who literally pulled another police officer off of a harmless young man while the, man, the young man was being beaten, and she lost her job because of that. And these people, irrespective of their occupation and the indoctrination they've received, at the moment of conflict became peace officers. But if we assume that they're subject to execution because of the uniforms they wear, the costumes they wear, and the titles they, they claim, then a uh, hypothetical libertarian citizen arriving on the scene should kill all the police officers, not sparing the ones who actually acted in defense of the citizens. I think that's abhorrent. Will actions like those of Gerard and Amanda Miller shrink the police state or make it stronger? Oh, this is the sort of thing upon which police states thrive. Uh, they are fueled by an acceptance of lawless aggression, whether you're talking about what the people who act in the name of the state do or the public at large is willing to countenance. And I do think that one of the obvious and immediate consequences of this, and I think once again, this is an act of blowback from the drug from the drug war. These people had been recruited by law enforcement to be undercover assets, informants, and probably provocateurs. They've been habituated to state-sanctioned violence, and of course they acted beyond their assignment in killing a couple of fellow police officers. That's blowback, classic blowback. But I think what we're seeing as well is a type of blowback for libertarianism here because people are embracing what they did, not understanding how that fuels the dynamics that helps to consolidate even further the power of the police state. And immediately after that, of course, we've seen across the country uh, an enhancement of the tribal sensibility of police officers. And unfortunately, on the part of much of the public who are pre-programmed to worship these people as if they were somehow divine entities. So psychologically, morally, ethically, uh, in terms of both strategy and tactics, it's been a disaster for the cause of liberty because you cannot create a free society. You cannot have a revolution for liberty that will succeed using the tactics that have led to the failures of the last revolution. And I think that embracing this model uh, represents uh, a decision to embrace the worst elements of the, the revolution 
that led to the state we're trying to destroy through a peaceful revolution today. Fantastic analysis, Will Grigg. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a real wow. pleasure. Oh, the pleasure's been mine, and I really appreciate you having me on. Definitely. Have a great day.